Good afternoon, Insignio family. I'm Alejandro Guardiola from the Investment Solutions team. And today we have a very special guest with us. We've got Brandon Ahern, the CIO of Crane Shares. Welcome to the show, Brandon. Hey, great to be here, Alejandro. And happy holidays to you and your family. Thank you. You as well. So tell us a little bit about your role as a CIO at Crane Shares. Well, certainly my, my original job was to help make our founder and CEO's uh, vision investable, that he had this idea of uh, creating a family, a suite of exchange-traded funds around the growth elements of China's economy, uh, as well as gaining access into China's mainland, its A-share market. You know, this is 12 years ago. Uh, but really, the most important thing I do is spend a lot of time uh, helping end clients navigate what's happening in China, economically, politically, uh, that certainly it's on the other side of the world. Uh, it can be hard to find good sources of research, of information. And so ultimately, we endeavor to produce high quality research, and I lead those efforts in order to earn the trust of investors in navigating China's economy and capital markets, which will only grow and aren't going away over the next year, decade, or century. Indeed. And for those that are not intimately familiar with Crane Shares, uh, you guys have a suite of U.S.-listed ETFs as well as USITs, uh, some of them being China-focused. You've got international, uh, there's climate-aligned, as well as uh, some that are uncorrelated. Have I missed anything? No, no. Um, you know, we, you know, obviously the the core the majority of the assets today are in china investments um, at the same time uh we're big believers that in addition to china you know what's happening with the climate um is a another significant trend so we were very early in understanding uh carbon credit allowance futures uh that we listed the first carbon credit allowance future etf globally um, and built out a whole franchise about the climate. You know, I run the China business, but my colleague Luke Oliver runs climate. And then we've actually listed some exchange traded funds for friends and family, uh, people who don't want a whole board of directors and all the regulatory rigmarole. So we've listed a few ETFs uh, for some friends. Cool. Let's turn our attention to China. Uh, geopolitical tensions between the U.S. and China have been elevated for a couple of years now. Uh, can you provide an update on where U.S.-China relations are now and which direction you see that trending? Well, certainly China and the United States went through a proverbial COVID divorce that, that you know, during uh, COVID, there were COVID babies, but unfortunately there were COVID divorces. And Diplomatically, the U.S. and China, despite uh, the deep economic, the deep corporate ties, dipl diplomats from neither country visited one another for four years. And a year ago, Xi and Biden met in Bali. And that that started down this path where then Secretary of State Blinken went to China, followed by Janet Yellen followed by the climate czar, John Kerry, followed by Henry Kissinger, rest in peace, followed by Gina Raimondo, the secretary. And that all culminated in the Biden G summit in November um, at the APAC conference in San Francisco, where they two spent four hours together. Um, they agreed to some easy stuff, uh, fentanyl, um, uh, the military speaking to one another, some issues on climate. But but I think more importantly was that as a student or an observer of China, Xi went to Biden. And 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 in Chinese culture, that that is telling you something. And then Xi gave a speech to U.S. CEOs. And, and he didn't have to do that, right? He could have gone to, you know, San Francisco is a huge Chinatown, could have spoken to kind of uh, the home crowd, but he's chose to spoke to business leaders. 
And, and I know, you know, China, due to a number of things that have happened, there's a lot of skepticism. Trust has been broken. But today we found out that Xi is going to go to Davos. And, and Xi is trying to mend Xi, uh, China's reputation with foreign investors, foreign companies. And that is because China needs the world. No different than the world needs China. And and time, you know, they'll they have to prove that. So so I do think there's been a very important change, and that can help a lot on on investor sentiment. Certainly, you recently came back from China. You go often. Um, you were meeting with financial institutions and public companies. What were the biggest takeaways of your recent trip to China? Yeah, and I'll just share. Um, I spent. Um, Quite a bit of time in both Hong Kong as well as um, Shenzhen, China. Um, I met with both Tencent, uh, the very large um, internet uh, social media company, as well as BYD, the largest uh, manufacturer of electric vehicles and hybrid uh, vehicles globally. Both companies said, Brendan, what's, what's wrong with our stock? You know, in the case of Ten Cent, they said we've doubled revenue since October 2017, but that's our stocks at the same level. In the case of BYD, they said we've doubled revenue, but the stock hasn't moved since 2020. So, so I think I think despite the fundamentals, issues like the U.S.-China diplomatic relationship, zero COVID, um, a number of factors have weighed on investor sentiment and. Um, I think the most important thing I, I would say um, is that in Hong Kong, in China, restaurants were crowded, malls were crowded. Uh, you know, the weather was very temperate, and and what I saw visually does not make sense with what's happened. Uh, mm -hmm. With that, Hong Kong is on its way to its fourth negative year in a row. It's never happened before. Interesting. So in in essence, what I'm hearing is the paradigm of how people see China from here uh, is different than the reality on the ground floor. For sure. For sure. That, okay. yeah. Um, what, what about the local consumer and their access to credit or their willingness to take on credit? How, how does the local consumer look in China? The consumer has been hurt, was obviously hurt, very similar to you know, China's economy during zero COVID. And similar to China's economy has trough that if you look at the Citigroup China Economic Surprise Index, it continues to improve. So China is coming back, it's just coming back slowly and the Chinese government doesn't want to create inflation and more debt by giving people free money like many Westerns. So so the consumer has been very conservative coming out of zero COVID. The scar tissue of what they went through, as well as the downdraft, the fall in property prices where two thirds of Chinese urban household wealth. Um, and so the decline in property prices has made households because they've lost money in property for the first time ever a little more more conservative which is all about this slow incremental economic rebound mm -hmm. okay you and you mentioned 12 years ago uh you were working uh to get access to the local the a share market can you give us a high level of you know between a shares eight shares Where's the best place to be situated if you're looking to get exposure to China? It's interesting. You know, I think Alejandro, like the sediment in Hong Kong was very was very poor because it's four years. The market's gone down. Uh, I, I met a Chinese hedge fund. He's down to 15 percent of his assets are in China. Now, uh, the down from 90 percent. He's like, I'm not a China, don't call me a China hedge fund. I'm an Asia hedge fund. Um, that in order to survive, he's had to buy Indian stocks or Japanese stocks. I, I met a research firm pre COVID. They had 50 U S asset manager and hedge funds as clients. They have four today. 
Uh, so so in in Hong Kong, people were very down. Now, when you ask them, how are you doing? They'd be like, oh, I'm doing great. <laughs> you know, the market's getting killed, but I'm personally I'm fine. In mainland China, I thought it was it was different that the market hasn't been down nearly as much. Uh, it's down two years in a row. And so I think there's reasons to be bullish on both markets, but for different reasons that that the onshore market is really what do the Chinese think about and meeting one of the largest asset managers in China, their deputy CEO. He said the Chinese government is buying stocks and if they're buying stocks, I should buy stocks. And in and, and the offshore market, in the Hong Kong market, I think there's a lot of reasons this market's been eviscerated. Things are improving. Um, and certainly if we have, I think, a decline in the dollar, uh, that would certainly go a long way to uh, giving a tailwind to the to the offshore market, the Hong Kong market. And OK, so let's talk about valuations here for a second. Uh, where are we? Today versus uh, historical, uh, if we if we look at China, well, we're at a point where, due to this downdraft, it's uh, we're almost at levels that are somewhat ridiculous, uh, particularly relative to U.S. stocks. So, so obviously, U.S. stocks over the last fourteen years have outperformed non-U.S. equities. Uh, very, very dramatically. And that includes China and includes emerging markets, but in general. So so all of this money over 14 years of underperformance has gone into U.S. stocks, making it, I believe, the most overcrowded trade maybe ever. And that's made some of the valuations um, almost a point of where it's laughable, where you could buy all 33 companies in K-Web, have almost $400 billion in Amazon has less revenue than the companies in aggregate in K-Web, have less cash flow, less net income, less earnings per share growth. So, so again, that's this underperformance over 14 years, 56 quarters. All this money has gone into the U.S., made valuations very, very stretched. Um, and I think there is an opportunity for non-U.S. equities, including China and emerging markets going forward. So U.S. and global investors are very underweight China today. Uh, what what gives? Well, some of this is just how do you go to your back to your clients after 56 quarterly meetings? Um, uh, why do we why are we diversifying out of U.S. stocks? The more we've diversified, the worse you've done. Um, and that's true for institutional investors. Uh, that, you know, if you have to go to your board or your trustees or your directors or your investment committee, mm -hmm. the more you've diversified, the worse you've done. And so I just think there's a huge overweight globally, particularly in the U.S. to U.S. stocks. Um, and I think investors forget that from 1999 to 2009, U.S. stocks had a negative return. And that that 10 years of underperformance was the foundation for today's bull market. And I think that same argument can you be made that the foundation has been built for the next 10 years for China, for emerging markets, for non-US equities. Perfect segue to uh to jump into the outlook for 2024 uh as it relates to China. Yeah, certainly 2024 uh uh from their calendar, the Zodiac calendar, it's the year of the dragon. Mm. So this is the most important year for China from just a cultural perspective. And, and I think it the government is aware of this idea that China faces its Lehman moment. I disagree. The government is very aware of the challenges faced by the economy. We saw that just two days ago, the you know they had their big economic meeting, the Central Economic Work Conference, and and the government acknowledged the problems. the The question then becomes, what are they going to do about it? And and I'm telling you, that I just don't believe they're going to sit at the table and do nothing. Uh, this far, we've seen stimulus. 
uh, that they've been stimulating. I mentioned it's it's been it's been incremental, but they continue to nudge the the economy along, um, and we see a path for more stimulus to support the economy in 2024. They're just not doing the proverbial policy bazooka, the helicopter money that we saw like here mm-hmm. in the United States. So so it is coming. We just have to be a little patient. Correct. What would you tell investors about misconceptions? What, you know, things that you see on the ground in China versus what the media sometimes reports or the picture that they paint for China? It, it's very, you know, that's, I mean, that's the true value add, I think, of crane shares is to try to help investors like, you know, you know, like, you know, Alejandro, you and the team, like, you know, to provide a balanced data driven perspective. And I think there's a a lot of times a lot of hyperbole, a lot of um, conjecture, you know, from the media that is not they're not paid to tell the truth or report the facts they're. You know, they're paid to get people to click articles. And so so I think, you know, ultimately our value add is, you know, helping investors understand what's actually happening there. And it's it's you know, it's not an easy, you know, the last few years have been a struggle. Uh, It's been a difficult, difficult market. But I think at, at a bare minimum, we've told investors exactly what we're seeing and, um, you know, that's something that we'll continue to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, audience uh, reminder: if you, there's any questions, uh, you can you can uh, submit a question in the Q and A. And we do have one question regarding uh, comments and outlook uh, for Baba. Okay, so Alibaba <laughs> um, is obviously um, you know big big player in e-commerce. You know, Pin Duo Duo um, is is among the best performers in K Web within the China internet space. The other being actually NetEase, which is a online gaming company. Um, now, what's driving Pin Duo Duo stock is not not them taking market share from Alibaba in China. Pin Duo Duo is growing very rapidly because of Temu, their effort. Uh, to provide uh, low cost, cheap goods to U.S. consumers, and it is performing very well. The challenge for Alibaba is one: the slow comeback of China's economy and domestic consumption. Uh, that the consumer is coming back, just coming back slowly. They also face a competitive threat, but it's not it's not by Tamu, it's not by Pinduoduo, it's by ByteDance. That ByteDance is doing in their the TikTok in China is called Do One Do Yun, D O U Y N, and they're doing these short videos with KOLs, key opinion leaders like the Kim Kardashian of, uh, and those short videos are selling goods. So ByteDance is actually a competitive threat to Alibaba. It's also a competitive threat uh, because they're pulling ad dollars from established players. So so Alibaba has lost some market share, but it's against the backdrop of the slow consumer, the slow economy. So, So... I'm I'm confident Alibaba will come back. Um, you know, it's been depressed for you know these reasons, but it's not like they're going bankrupt. If you think they're going, you know, I always say look at their bonds. Alibaba's bonds are trading basically at par value because they have a huge amount of cash, like 80 billion in cash. They just paid out their first dividend. So uh, they're buying back stocks significantly. So I'm not, I'm you know, I think. I think, yes, they face competition, but everyone does. Everyone does. Sure. Sure. 
regarding the uh, the ETFs that you guys managed, uh, they're actively managed. So tracking air from benchmark was what you know uh, was what we, what we want. Uh, could you could you talk to us about uh, two of those ETFs? Let's take a look under the hood. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly K K Web, our China Internet ETF, is a really a, a kind of a growth factor on China. Uh, it's one of the largest China ETFs globally, and and it holds the internet company, so it owns the Pinduoduos and Netties, but also Tencent and uh, the Alibabas and uh, Meduan, which is an, another good company, a food delivery company, uh, Trip.com, which is the big online travel agency. And so it allows you to not take the single stock risk because I, I think I think three years ago, everyone would say, or even two, you know, I'm going to buy Alibaba. Uh, but Alibaba really underperformed NetEase, which no one would have picked, including me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and lo and behold, yeah, NetEase and then Pinduoduo developed Temu. And, and so it allows you to um, – diversify across the space not take that single stock risk so so it's really our flagship fund and is unique because it has no financials no energy no materials no industrials no real estate it's just these growth geared companies that's why i call it a growth factor i contrast that with kba is our msci china a50 it's the 50 largest companies on the Shanghai and Shenzhen, uh, the A share market. And that is more of a value factor. Um, It does have some of these slower growth sectors. Uh, At the same time, I mentioned the Chinese government is literally buying Shanghai and Shenzhen stocks. So so we're a bit of a beneficiary from the Chinese government is telling investors in China, you should be buying stocks and they're incentivizing that by saying no more IPOs in mainland China, no insider sales, no major shareholders are allowed to sell. Companies should pay a dividend. Companies should buy back stocks. It's, it's very interesting that optically the government is aware that the onshore market has come down for two years. And KBA is, you know, it's um, the ETF is in dollars. The underlying securities are in Riembi. So, so if you have a Fed easing cycle, if you say what Jerome Powell is, is correct, then we will benefit from the depreciation of the dollar. Mm-hmm. Uh, from from portfolio construction uh, perspective, uh, A shares I've noticed have a very low correlation to the index, which is the ACWI, right? MSCI All, All World uh, Index. Um, they've got a lower correlation than even some frontier markets to that yeah. same index, uh, which is which is fantastic what it how how does it compare and contrast to the eight shares yeah so if you think about like k-web and hong kong are really foreign investors definition of china you know that's driven by msci and uh so it's mainly hong kong is mainly you know what do foreign investors think about china where kba the shanghai shenzhen companies are predominantly held by investors in china so it's What do the Chinese think about China? And I think what they there can be a huge disparity there. And and I think, you know, from studying this market for almost 11 years now, I can tell you. The way that market reacts to events globally is very different because it's something that a lot of times investors in China are like. Well, that doesn't really affect me. Like, you know, why does that why is that you know something I should worry about? So so it's 
that that is part of this low correlation is this low foreign investor participation in the companies that we hold in KBA. Okay. The, the other thing that uh, seemed a little out of whack was uh, there's 5% China exposure in the ACWI versus 47% for the U.S. Uh, so truly, I mean, the U.S., even though it's not 10 times larger than China, it has almost a 10 times as large representation in the index. So as an investor, you're forced to be buying more and more and more of U.S., uh, do, do you do you see that sort of you know recalibrating? I I do I do I think I think you know investors do have a lot of implied China exposure through U.S. and global multinationals that you know if if um, you know certainly you know Echo Patrol and SQM and Petrobras and you know, there's a lot a lot of companies globally that do a lot of business with China so you you know. No different than Apple and Tesla and Exxon Mobil. You know, they get a lot of revenue. So you have a lot of implied revenue to China. But at the same time, explicit exposure is very, very low. And I think that's where investors, you know, really have an opportunity um, around China to get that to maybe reduce some of that implied China exposure and get some explicit China exposure. This is just simply buying, you know, sell some of what's high and buy what some of what's low. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we say that all the time, but how often do we actually do it, right? Right, right. Uh, geopolitically, what, uh, what percentage chance do you assign to China invading Taiwan, for example? I've been very, very skeptical. Um, because China's economy is geared to the West, that Russia had nothing to lose because they had no, you know, their China's economy is so geared in terms of export driven manufacturing that we've been very, very skeptical invasion of China. I'm sorry, of Taiwan. Um, you know, in our head, we say, you know, Taiwan, China is no different than Russia or Ukraine, but they're they're very, very different. And I think I think probably the biggest thing I would point out to investors, and I was in Taiwan in August, and people said, you know, we don't we just want to be left alone. Uh, and I think, you know, people weren't building bunkers or bunkers or filling sandbags. But but remember, the majority of Taiwan sits a hundred miles from China, but part of it is just three miles from China. That there's this thing called Kinmen County, um, which is part of Taiwan and sits right off the coast of China, three miles. And if you look, you know, down here on the bottom is from Google Maps. Like you can see, this is a school with the the track. Uh, people live there and, and people in Taiwan were like, you know, we don't, why, why would China invade? Those are our brothers and sisters. Um, and, and the proof of that is this Kinmen County. So, so listen, I think, I think a lot of us politicians, if they're talking about Taiwan or China, guess what they're not talking about? The thirty-three trillion dollars of debt the U.S. government has, homelessness, drug addiction, crime, and this distraction technique of talking about China and not talking about the real problems. I think I think a lot of people are going to start to see for what it is that you know China and the U.S. are highly intertwined economically. And politicians do actually know that they actually, you know, with a TV microphone in front of them, you know, may, you know, they'll they'll bash China. Meeting with them one on one, I can tell you, many many of them are much more balanced because so many companies from the states they represent do so much business with China. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I like think about Texas. 
Texas is the largest exporting state to China. Tesla, ExxonMobil, Texas Instruments. You know, so I think I think some of this is for the media narrative, but you know, um, I don't. I think it's 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 a shame uh, because Americans should be more focused on the problems, many of which have been created in Washington D.C. Indeed, Brandon, we're coming up towards the end of our session. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with the last word. Closing thoughts for prospective investors considering China. What 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 do you want to leave them with? Well, you know, certainly we do think it is a a, a good opportunity. At the same time, we can't predict the future. So I think um, there's ways you can protect yourself by dollar cost averaging, by volatility adjusting your position. Um, you know, there's option strategies you can use along with uh, K-Web, for instance. So there's ways that you can protect yourself and have some exposure, but making sure that you have some sort of downside protection, uh, because, you know, we don't pretend to believe we can predict the future. Uh, but we do think there is a very strong opportunity from what we see in China's economy recovering slowly. Uh, the importance of U.S.-China relations stabilizing, mm -hmm. um, as well as the importance of it being the year of the dragon culturally in China. Amazing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if uh, if you wanted to follow more of uh, Brendan's work, uh, he publishes a, um, a piece called ChinaLastNight.com, uh, which is insights into uh, the, you know, the markets uh, from the day before. And with that, uh, uh, Brandon, thank you so much for being on the show. We uh, we appreciate your guys' partnership and looking forward to uh, to the next time that we can do this. Yeah, likewise. Great seeing you, Alejandro. And certainly, once again, yeah, you and your family have a great uh, holiday season. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Insignia Financial Group LLC comprises a number of operating businesses engaged in the offering of brokerage and advisory products and services in various jurisdictions, principally in Latin America. Brokerage products and services are offered through Insignia International Financial Services LLC, headquartered in Puerto Rico, and through Insignia Securities LLC, headquartered in Miami. Both are members of the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, FINRA, and Securities Investors Protection Corporation, CIPIC. Investment advisory products and services are offered through Insignia Advisory Services, LLC, an investment advisor registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. In Uruguay, advisory services are offered through Insignia International Asesores de Inversión Uruguay, SA, Insignia Asesores de Inversión LATAM, SRL, and Insignia Asesores de Inversión de Uruguay, SRL, in Argentina, and through Insignia Argentina, SAU, and in Chile through Insignia Asesorías Financieras, SPA. Collectively, these eight operating businesses make up Insignio Financial Group. To learn more about the broker dealers, including their conflicts of interest and compensation practices, please go to https colon forward slash forward slash insignio.com forward slash disclosures forward slash or via www.finra.org. To learn about Insignio Advisory Services and any conflicts related to its advisory services, please see its form ADV and brochure, which can be found at, in at investment public advisor public disclosures website https colon forward slash forward slash advisor info dot sec dot gov forward slash